This morning we have a guest speaker. It is Reverend Lawrence Bergman. <laughs> and he's been a good friend for many years. He's a friend of City of Light as well as a personal friend of mine. He's been in unity for over 50 years. And he has delivered talks from Brisbane, Australia to London, England. And he's, he's a very knowledgeable teacher. And I'm always excited when he's here. So please welcome Larry. Reverend Larry Berkman. Thank you, John. I'm always honored when I'm invited back somewhere because I never, ever know how I'm going to be received. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. And for those of you who don't know me, just wait and see. I am free. I am unlimited. There are no chains that bind me. Is this me? Is this you? Are you bound somewhere that you don't know? Or are you going to let yourself free? I am free. I am really free. I'm as free as a bird in the air. And you must be too. Is this a dream? Or is this reality? Can we always tell what is a dream and what is reality? Hmm. One of my favorite Broadway shows is Once Upon a Mattress. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many remember that because um, it it's, was on Broadway before some of you were born. It opened in May of 1959. I remember I was going to New York to meet some friends, and they said, no matter what you see, you better see Mattress. I said, huh? Never heard of it. It just started this week. Okay, so why not? This actually was Carol Burnett's introduction to Broadway. I mean, the first thing she'd ever done. She was a nobody. Once Upon a Mattress is a spoof of a 1835 fairy tale, The Princess and the Pea, by Hans Christian Andersen. And you know, he always did these lovely, delightful things with a twist. So the show opened with this charming, delightful, dreamy sequence of the traditional story. And then the moderator stepped forward and said, just wait, let me tell you the real story behind the scenes on this. Because, you know, oftentimes we see the mirage, but we don't see the reality. And the reality was four major characters, King Sextimus, who was always chasing girls. Queen Agravain, who was always a pain in the... <clears throat> then there was Prince Dauntless, who was always clueless. And Princess Fred. Princess Fred? Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett made her Broadway debut crawling over the moat wall, dripping in her raspberry dress. And then they quickly redressed her and left this pile of rags on the floor, dripping wet, and someone rushed in and used that rag to clean up the mess she'd left behind. Uh, for the rest of the story, I suggest you get the movie and look at it. It is charming. It is delightful. It is fun. I recommend every minute of it. You just don't know what's coming next until you see it. Now, let me compare this to what I call the American dream family. Ah. Society says that each and every one of us, that's each and every one of us, not some of us, is married to someone of the opposite sex. And we have two children, a boy and a girl. But we also have a cat and a dog. And beyond that, we live in a Cape Cod house with a white picket fence. Or perhaps in Atlanta here, you're in a 1960s brick ranch. Now, is this our reality? Or is this a psychological myth? I'm not going to ask how many of you fit into that concept. But, truth or reality? Now, or has it ever been? Has it ever been what society says we are or ought to be? Now remember, we are each 
a unique individuation of Godness. I am a unique individuation of Godness. I want you to say that with me. I am a unique individuation of Godness. That is truth with a capital T. That is truth with a capital T. I am free. I am unlimited. There are no chains that bind me. And any of you who really know me know that that sort of is true. I am free to be the me that God and I created me to be. Aha! Let's do that. I am free to be the me that God and I created me to be. This is not unique to today. This has always been the truth in the world. Now, you all know of Noah. Can you imagine the feedback he got from his neighbors when he started to build that thing in his backyard? You do not conform to the neighborhood standards. Building code does not allow this to happen here. You must find somewhere else to build that thing. Well, who got left behind? The unique person who did his own thing or everyone who said, this is the way life is and you must conform? The conformers get left behind. Are you a conformer? Are you going to be left behind? Or are you going to be you the uniqueness of God creation, and do your thing in conjunction with God, of course, and be remembered for it. In Genesis 6.13, it says, God said to Noah. God said to Noah. Well, of course, I have to ask, what language did God speak in at that point? Did God speak in English or Chinese? Perhaps ancient Hebrew. Now, you get the point. God does not speak in a language with words. Oh, dear. God speak must be divined through inspiration, dream, vision, insight, perception, divine ideas. Many places in the Bible it simply says, God spoke in a dream to whomever. You find it over and over and over again. God speaks, but it's always in a dream or in a semi-state of consciousness. Not in everyday words, ever, ever, ever. It is up to each of us to discern and interpret those perceptions and how they are supposed to manifest through each of us in our lives. Because we are each an expression of Godness, we each interpret these things individually. What works for you may not work for you or me, what works for me may not work for you or you. But we must reach out to the great beyond, tap these divine ideas, these perceptions out of universal substance, grasp them to us, embrace them, interpret them, and let them go in our lives. That's why my life is different than your life, which is different than your life. Because we're each individuations of Godness. We're each created in the image and likeness of God. But God doesn't look like me or you or you. It isn't physically that we were created that way. It's through our mind. Our mind. The mind is the most powerful force in the universe. So God doesn't speak in words. How does she speak? Perception. Now, 
Now, how many of you know who Carolyn Mace is? Good, 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 good. Carolyn Mace is a renowned medical intuitive. What does that mean? It means she tells you what's wrong with you through her third eye without even meeting you sometimes. And she would, would share with people that she needed to learn a new nonverbal language because she would perceive something in your body like a cement pipe, a cement pipe, but that would talk to her and she had to learn what these symbols meant in terms of someone's body. <clears throat> nonverbal language happened when she started analyzing people's medical issues. Visions would come to her in non-words. Probably many of you have experienced some of this kind of stuff, maybe even unknowingly. At one point, I was studying with intuitives, and uh, one of them said, here, hold this. It was someone's ring. I said, what do you feel? I don't feel anything. No, you can't. That's not the answer. What do you feel? I don't feel anything. No, I'm not going to let you off the spot. What do you feel? Eh, I was a novice. I didn't know what to say. So eventually I just made this statement and said, my guts feel horrible. I feel sick inside. And she said, very good. Very good. What do you mean? This person is dying of cancer of the internal organ. Wow. The things you don't know that you do know would amaze you. If we were all developed our perceptions, how much more do we really know than we think we know? We perceive and understand many things non-verbally. A non-verbal language. It really is a language, but you have to know how to interpret the pieces to understand what's being said. We each have a direct pipeline to God. Ooh. We each have a direct pipeline to God. How? Through prayer and meditation. Prayer and meditation are the opposite sides of the same coin. In prayer, I perceive connection with God. But in meditation, I perceive God's connection with me. When I align my mind with God mind, I divine God thought, God ideas, divine ideas. My obligation is to interpret these ideas to become manifest in my life. That's my obligation. Now I have to go back and say, did Noah conform to the norms of the time? Well, you know he didn't. Was, you know, was Noah unique in the annals of history? Was he the only one who didn't conform to the norms? Let's look at Abram, who later became known as Abraham. He passed his wife Sarai off as his sister. What? You're my wife? I'm going to say, you're not my wife, you're my sister. So she could be taken into Pharaoh's court as another concubine. You want to give your wife up as a concubine? Saved his life. Did Abraham and Sarah conform to the norms of their time? Do the norms of any time say, you pass your wife off as your sister so someone else can use her for their Pleasure. I know it's church. I have to be careful. Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. I don't think this is accepted anywhere. But I wasn't back in Egypt in those times. So what did Moses do? Moses killed the Egyptian. He hid his body and he fled. Was Moses exhibiting typical behavior of his day? Probably. 
But then again, look at whole, Moses' whole life. Was that typical of anything? Well, the typical people left, get left behind, and the people who are unique and exceptional are remembered in the annals of history. What historical individual conformed to the norms of his day and yet became exceptional and, remem and is remembered in the annals of history? Can anyone name any of them? I think there were a few, if any. Maybe none at all. All the great thinkers of their day bucked the tradition and became giants of the time. Those are the ones who are remembered. Not the everyday nobodies, but the exceptional somebodies. Are you an exceptional somebody or are you a nobody? Who are you? Who are you? I am a happy, healthy, radiant child of God. Together, I am a happy, healthy, radiant child of God. The great inventors certainly did not contain their efforts to conform to the modalities of their day. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd never remember them. Jesus was confronted with a woman taken in adultery. Tradition dictated, not suggested, tradition dictated that that woman taken in adultery be stoned to death. I have to ask, what happened to the man? If she's caught in adultery, she can't be in adultery by herself. But that's beside the point. Men rule. Okay. Jesus was doodling in the sand. And while he was doodling in the sand, he said, He who has no sin cast the first stone. Guess what, folks? No stones were cast. And he said to the woman, no one condemns you, neither do I. Go forth and sin no more. So you are the woman taken in adultery. Whatever your past sin might have been, you can say, behind me, Satan, I'm moving forward into the future. My whole future is based on my relationship with God through prayer and meditation, I discern what is best for me to exhibit in my life to go forth and be one with God. Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman at the well. Oops! You know no man talks to a woman outside of the family situation, especially in public. You do not do it. What we don't know are the norms of the time. I mean, today you walk up to uh, someone in the mall you don't know and you chit-chat. Not then. No, 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 no. You did not. No man outside of the family situation ever, ever, ever talked to a woman. And the woman certainly didn't talk to the man. Jesus buck tradition at every turn. Jesus bucked tradition at every turn. He said, I am the way. I will show you how to be one with yourself, one with God, one with spirit. Follow me. All the things I do, you will do greater. Following me doesn't mean following him down the street three steps behind. It means Think of how I function. Can you function as I function? I will show you the way. Take my way and move forward. You often hear people say, in Jesus' name, do whatever. And I want to say, Adam, in the name of Albert Einstein, split. Now, really, do you think that Adam is going to split because I use the name of Albert Einstein? Certainly not. Does that mean that the name Jesus is a magic word, open sesame? No. When it says, in the name of Jesus, it means follow the procedure that Jesus followed in all of his 
ways of thinking and doing. And if you do as Jesus did, you can get the same results that he got. Because you are just as much a child of God as Jesus was. Who are you to conform to the norm? Well, maybe we analyze what the norms are and decide if it's going to be appropriate for me or for the people around me. Just be careful which norms you choose to conform to and which norms you choose not to conform to because there can be repercussions. Prayer and meditation have been the connection to individuality, inspiration, cosmic direction since the creation of humankind, both individually and corporately. <clears throat> this country was started and conceived in prayer. What? You probably didn't know that. The first Continental Congress met in Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia in the fall of 1774. It was opened by prayer by Sam Adams. Even though the colonies were very diverse and practiced many different denominations, they were spiritually divergent. But Sam Adams created a prayer drawing these communities together, drawing these colonies together, embracing the different denominations, carefully not offending anybody, but bringing them together in prayer. We start all church services with prayer. Public services are started with prayer. Prayer is the initiation of come from the outer world into the inner world so that we may be at one with each other to produce a oneness from whatever our meeting consists of. I know that doesn't sound like the norm, but think about it. Just think about it. When you are in a business meeting and it gets a little bit tense and people are grappling from both sides in disagreement, the wise person, hopefully the moderator, says, let us take a minute of silence. They don't say prayer. They say, let us take a minute of silence or let us take a break. Go to the water cooler and have a sip. Go to the whatever. What is that doing? That is a time out from tension. It is a time, especially if it's going to be a period of silence of two or three minutes in that same room with everybody stopping. Stop. No words. Just stop. And you take a deep breath and you relax. And you know what happens? The minds all get together, not at this beta level, but an alpha level, above and beyond where we are. You don't solve a problem at the level of the problem. You go one step further to ask for universal guidance. And then when you come back together two or three minutes later, you discover that the whole attitude of the room has changed. And you can then begin to communicate with each other and solve the problem that you are grappling with before you took that break. I know this sounds weird, but I strongly suggest that you try it the next time you're in a meeting and things get a little bit tense. Silence does wonderful things. It really does. All of our great thoughts came in silence. Even if you're in the hubbub in the middle of a city, your mind can be silent and receive direction. It's the silence of the mind. Do you remember Henry David Thoreau? He's best known for something about you dance to a different drummer. You follow a different drummer? Let's look at his real words. He wrote a poem. 
If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. Somehow I say, that must be his form of prayer and meditation. You know, he lived in this little, in a little cabin on Walden Pond, which at that point was way, way out in the outskirts of Boston. Now, today, it's in the middle of the thriving communities. But remember him. And I say to you, who is your drummer? What music do you hear? Are you in tune with God's thoughts? Do you tune into God's thoughts through mer prayer and meditation daily? Every day. Every day. Not once a week. Every day. I can't tell you how important it is to have your time of silence, your time with God. I don't care what you call it. You can call it prayer and meditation. Those are nice churchy terms. To sit there in the silence with gentle, peaceful music works fine. It elevates your mind to a different sphere. Go to the spheres of the universe to get universal knowledge. Get divine ideas. Get inspired and bring them back into your life and see how they manifest. We are each a unique individuation of Godness. Together, I am a unique individuation of Godness. Ralph Waldo Emerson, along with Henry David Thoreau, were transcendentalists. Wow, that's a nice big word. Transcendentalists. Weirdo nonconformers, if you would, in the early and mid-1800s. Haha, long time ago. Well, not really. They were the forerunners of the New Thought movement of the middle and late 1800s, and we're all part of that. Unity is one of the major pieces left from the New Thought movement of the late 1800s. Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, used to say that he was going to headquarters. What did that mean? Do you all know what that meant? I believe that he used that phraseology to tell others that he was going into a time of prayer and meditation. Going to headquarters was Charles Fillmore's connection to God. You can call it anything you want. You go to God. Go to God every day, every day, morning or night or both. Just have a peaceful time. Sit there. Sit in the silence. Listen to the music of the spheres and God's words in nonverbal language will come to you. Through prayer and meditation, we each have our own unique, personal, individual pipeline to God, the universal thought. I believe that prayer and meditation are the most powerful forces in the universe. In prayer, I know my oneness with God. And in meditation, I know God's oneness with me. In Genesis 1, it states, we are created in the image and likeness of God. You and I are each created in the image and likeness of God. Not our bodies, but our minds. That means that we have the same qualities that God has. Oh, God, I'm a God. Yes, you're a God and I'm a God. We can do what God did and what God still does do. The difference is scale and magnitude. I like to think that we are to God as a glass of ocean water is to the entire ocean. It has the basic components it just doesn't have the scale and the magnitude. We are each unique individuations of Godness. Robert Fulgham, who wrote, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, 
I watched an interview with him one day, and he was asked what he was. You know, so often, when we are talking with someone we don't know, they want a pinpoint. They want a pigeonhole. What are you? They want one or two or three words that they can pigeonhole so they know who you are. And he sat there. Who are you? Who are you, the moderator said. And he said, I am the best Robert Fulgen that I can be. Wow. Who are you? Who are you? Are you the dentist? Are you the ditch digger? You are the best you that you can be. And when you communicate with God on a daily basis, you and God have created you to be the best you that you can be. So I entreat you to be the best you that you can be. How can that be? Pray and meditate. Pray and meditate. Pray and meditate. Broken record. Pray and meditate. As God created by thinking things into existence, so can we also with the power of our minds. We create with our minds. The mind is the most powerful force in the universe. It can move mountains. But if I can rent a tractor, it can do it more easily. The mind is our creative force. Be ye transformed by the renewal of your minds that you may discern what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for you. That's Romans 12, 2. One of the most powerful statements. Use your power of imagination to image the you that you choose to be. You must image with your imagination the you that you want to become. Listen to the still, small voice within, just as Eliza listened to God. The still, small voice within, not through thunder, fire, and storm, but the still, small voice within. This is how you discern truth, the truth for you. I create me from the inside, from my thoughts. I think me into being. The thoughts that I had yesterday are what created me to be the me that I am today. The thoughts that you are thinking today are creating the you that you will be tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. I choose to create me in all that I do. My mind creates my life. If you're in some kind of a profession, you didn't just drop in at the last minute. You had to think ahead of time to get the proper training so you could have the job that you've got. Because most jobs require some kind of training before you get the job. You don't just walk in and say, hey, I'm here, I'm great, I want the job. They say, well, what did you do? What did you study? What is your background? You don't got none of those, you don't got the job. You create the you that you choose to be. You want to be here? You watch those steps to get there. I align my mind with God mind, and God and I create the me that God and I choose for me to be. Or we say in unity, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Together, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. And it's true. In other words, if you change your thinking, your life will change accordingly. Ooh, that's heavy. That's a responsibility. Your mind has created you and put you where you are today you want a different life, think differently. Now, 
okay, unity is relatively new. It's only 125 years old. But this is basically a reworking of Proverbs 23.7. And that's a little bit older. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But isn't that true? Whatever you are on the inside radiates. Have you heard someone say, your actions speak so loud I can't hear what your words are saying? They read your body. They read your mind. It isn't just what you say. It's how you say it. That's the creative force within you. We are each an individuation of Godness. I am a unique individuation of Godness. Together, I am a unique individuation of Godness. I am free to be the me that, I, that God and I created me to be. Together, I am free to be the me that God and I created me to be. Thank you, God. Amen.